Honorable Maitripal Sirisena, Minister of Health, Professor Vajra Disanayaka, President Sri Lanka Medical Association, members of the Council, past presidents of SLMA, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I consider this as a great privilege to be able to deliver the SLMA oration at this 125th anniversary celebrations. Being able to deliver the most prestigious medical oration of this country, I consider it as an honor bestowed on me, and I thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Global report on non-communicable diseases published by the WHO in 2010 highlighted that the disease burden due to NCDs is on the rise. This graph shows the distribution of the non-communicable diseases uh, denoted in red by the geographical and economic regions of the world for both gender groups. Most affected geographical region is the Southeast Asia and economically it's the low middle income region. Diabetes prevalence is expected to be about 10% in both Southeast Asia region and low middle income region. A significant contributor had been insufficient physical activity. As a region, Southeast Asia has, is having a lower prevalence of physical inactivity. But from a socioeconomic point of view, the middle income category for which we belong has almost a third of its population physically inactive. And I guess yesterday's run would have been a good wake up call for that. There is no doubt that non-communicable disease burden is on the rise. And the WHO report published in 2005 on the prevention of NCDs highlighted that there are no socioeconomic age or gender boundaries for this distribution. Therefore, prevention would be a vital investment that could be done cost effectively. Childhood obesity, the new form of malnutrition, is spreading in epidemic proportions all over the world. The 2010 report highlighted that the prevalence in the lower middle income countries, denoted by the red line, is on the rise and projected to be the second highest by 2015. According to the NCD profile published by the WHO in 2011 for Sri Lanka, NCDs accounted for 65% of all deaths in this country. More than half of uh, deaths, or more than a quarter of the deaths in male and one sixth in female with NCDs die below 60 years of age. And more than half of the NCD deaths are caused by cardiovascular and diabetes. The same report highlighted that physical inactivity as the main cause of behavior risk factor in this group. The pathophysiology of obesity is driven by the excess body fat content. The amount of fat associated with morbidity in children is not clearly understood. Few studies have attempted to identify the fat content associated with this risk factor. And a percentage fat mass of about 32% in girls and 25% in boys would be a prudent cutoff value for the prevention of non-communicable disease in South Asian populations. Obesity could affect any organ of the body in a growing child, and almost no organ is spared. Insulin resistance would lead to the development of many metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Clustering of such metabolic abnormalities was first noted by Morgani in the 18th century from Padua, Italy. In the 20th century, Karl Heinsberg, Ice Kylin pioneered some of the work, which was followed up by many others later on. But the real turning point came in 1988 when Dr. Gerald Reven, who at the Banting Lecture renewed the concept of Syndrome X as the clustering of a group of cardiovascular risk factors. Since then, the syndrome was given several names and six main components have been identified and attempts had been made to find out a working diagnostic criteria in order to make a clinical diagnostic diagnosis in day-to-day -day clinical practice. However, many of these definitions had their shortcomings in practice. In 2006, the International Diabetic Federation, or the IDF, 
proposed a worldwide definition for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, which was a much simpler version and could be applied in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Metabolic syndrome is not confined to adults. Studies have shown that it is prevalent among child, children and especially among obese children, and with a worsening obesity, the prevalence increases. In one of our previous studies, we highlighted that almost one-fifth of the population of childhood children with obesity had metabolic syndrome with a female preponderance. The ever-rising epidemic of childhood obesity made uh, and the associated metabolic syndrome made Professor Paul Simmet of the International Diabetic Federation to state that I quote, this would be the first generation where children may die before their parents, unquote. Therefore, in year 2007, the IDF published a new set of metabolic syndrome diagnostic criteria to be used in 10 to 16 year old children. They recommended using adult guidelines for children about 16 years, and they also recommended children below 10 years to be screened if they have risk factors, but not to make a diagnosis due to the lack of evidence. However, the present IDF cutoff values may not be realistic, as they have suggested applying high single cutoff values across all age groups. This could underestimate the problem as the biological state of children vary with age and sex. A single cutoff value will, will not give a true picture. South Asian populations are well known to have a high fat content in their body. And this YY paradox picture, which appeared in the Lancet Journal a few years ago, maybe it's a good uh, reminder about that. Professor Yajnik from India, who is on to the right of the picture, and Professor Yudkim from Britain had the same BMI, or body mass index level, of 22.3. But you can see Professor Yajnik from India had more than two and a half times body fat uh, compared to his Caucasian counterpart. This quite eloquently demonstrates that we South Asians have a different body composition, and that is more body fat for any given body mass index value. Excess of body fat increased the risk of many non-communicable diseases, and undoubtedly this could be a reason for the increase in the prevalence of non-communicable diseases among South Asian population alongside high infectious disease burden. Wincup and co-workers from Britain demonstrated this fact quite clearly in a group of 8 to 12-year-old British children of South Asian and white Caucasian origins. This study showed that South Asian children had insulin resistance starting from a younger age and is closely associated with adiposity. Therefore, prevention of insulin resistance should start from a very young age. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I designed this study to identify the non-communicable disease-related metabolic derangement among 5 to 15-year-old children attending schools in Colombo district of Sri Lanka and identify the associations to the fat content of the body, anthropometric parameters, and early growth in life. A two-stage probability proportionate to size cluster sampling technique was used to recruit a minimum sample of 790 children from 15 schools in Colombo District, assuming an obesity prevalence of 2% and a dropout rate of 5%. Stratified by age and gender, children were randomly selected from each school. Studied with any students with any illness or on medication were excluded. After ethical clearance, the study was conducted at the clinical laboratory of the professorial pediatric unit at Lady Ridgeway Hospital. The total body fat was derived using whole body bioimpedance analysis technique using the in-body 230 machine. Assessment made by the machine was validated against body composition assessed by Sri Lankan-based BIA and height weight equations, which I had developed in one of my previous research and it showed very good agreement. Height, weight, waist circumference, hip circumference was measured using standard protocols, and blood pressure was measured using a spigma manometer after 10 minute rest in the seated position. Blood was drawn after 12 hour overnight fast for blood, uh, fasting blood sugar, fasting insulin, 
lipid profile and ALT. And two hours after a glucose load, blood was again taken for random blood sugar and insulin level. Blood, blood was analyzed at the Reproductive Health Laboratory of the Obstetrics and Gynecology Department of University of Colombo using standard protocols. Metabolic derangements were derived where the vase circumference was considered as more than 90th centile using UK standards, then abdom abnormal glucose homeostasis, HDL levels and triglycerides were based on the IDF cutoff values given, and the blood pressure was used as above two standard deviations of the cutoff using, again, UK standards. We used a moving target for detection of hypertension instead of a single cutoff as supposed to suggested by the IDF to prevent under detection of hypertension. 932 children were recruited and 920 final were included in the final analysis. The sample was segregated according to the age categories of 5 to 10 and 10 to 15 to fall in line with the IDF classification. There were three additional subgroups that we studied, mainly based on the availability of data for birth weights, physical activity, and insulin levels. The characteristics of the study population is given in this busy slide. But what I would like to highlight is that the females have a high content of body fat uh, compared to their counterparts of the same age. The distribution of the mean metabolic parameters for each sex of the each age group is given, and most of these values increase with the age. When we looked at the nutritional status of this population, 3.5% of these children were obese according to the International Obesity Task Force, which is a WHO subgroup classification. And about 48% of the population was suffering from thinness as well. In 2010, we published a set of body mass index and waist circumference cutoff values for Sri Lankan children. And according to that cutoff value, you can see about 34% and 22% and, uh, uh, and of the population has inappropriately high waist circumference and a body mass index, respectively. Distribution of adverse metabolic outcome profile according to the age category and sex is given in this table. Considerable number had systolic and diastolic hypertension, where 15 were pre-diabetic, but there were not a single case of diabetic in this group. 15% had high cholesterol levels and 4% had high triglyceride levels. The distribution of the metabolic derangement is almost equal in both gender groups, and with advancing age, there is a slight increase in the prevalence. And the obese children had a much more uh, high level. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome in the overall study sample was 1.6%, but among obese children, it was again little over one-fifth of the uh, obese population, which is keeping up with most of the other international data. Acanthosis, which is a thickening of the skin at characteristic size of the body, is one of the earliest manifestations of insulin resistance. Apart from disfigurement, it is an early warning sign of the change that occur in the internal metabolic environment. Children and parents could be directed to use this as a gauge of control of the adverse metabolic status as it disappears with the control of underlying disease states. And all these children had at least one abnormal metabolic parameter. The distribution of the metabolic derangements in the whole study population is given here. Little over 40% of the study population had at least one metabolic derangement, and this increased with the age. This shows the magnitude of the problem that we are going to face in years to come unless we take some drastic steps to curb this growing epidemic of obesity and related metabolic problems in children. The concept of metabolic syndrome per se in children and adolescents is still a matter of discussion, mainly due to the scarcity of data. But according to the International Diabetic Federation, it is a problem faced by many adults worldwide with a high risk of developing heart attacks and strokes late in life. There is no doubt that this is the final result of the effects that build up over years starting from early childhood. Cardiovascular risk 
accumulates. Development of metabolic derangements and its severity depends on how early the cardiovascular stick starts and the duration of the cumulative risk. New evidence shows that origins are as early as in fetal life. This cumulative effect could be the reason for the increase in prevalence of metabolic derangement seen in older age group compared to the younger age group in our own study. As Professor Alberti, one of the former presidents of the IDF highlighted, I quote, early detection followed by treatment is vital to halt the progression of the metabolic syndrome and safeguard the future health of children and adolescents, unquote. It is important that each component of the syndrome is identified as early as possible in order to prevent it progress into a syndrome. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this part of our research has shown that there is a high prevalence of non-communicable disease-related metabolic derangements among Sri Lankan children. It increases with age and increases with the obesity. A preliminary report of this work was presented at the Sri Lanka College of Pediatrics in 2010, and a full paper was discussed at the World Congress of Diabetes in Dubai 2011. Then we also looked at the insulin, resist, uh, re insulin resistant in a subsample of this population. The serum insulin in the fasting state, as well as two hours after a glucose load was measured in 309 individuals. Insulin resistance was calculated using uh, the homeostatic model, or what is called the home IR. The fasting and the two hour post glucose load insulin levels were almost double in the old age group compared to their younger counterparts. Home IR, or the insulin resistance, was double in old age group denoting that insulin sensitivity is decreasing with age. Similarly, with the increase in adiposity, the fasting insulin and two-hour postprandial insulin and insulin resistance increase, denoting that obesity is directly related to increased level of insulin and insulin resistance. There is a clear relationship between insulin levels and body mass index, waist circumference, and fat mass in the body. Therefore, any of these measures could be used as a surrogate marker of insulin resistance. Similarly, waste for height ratio, which is shown in the shades of green, showed a good relationship to insulin, but waste hip ratio, showed in uh, shades of blue, is not. We looked at the relationship between the fasting blood sugar and fasting insulin level. Apart from a wide uh, very few numbers, sorry, apart from a very few number of children who had impaired fasting glucose, majority were within the normal limits. However, few required high insulin levels to maintain the normal glycemic state. The same sample was looked at again, and the plot was made between fasting insulin and, uh, sorry, insulin at two hours after glucose load and the random blood sugar taken two hours after the glucose load. Apart from very few children who had impaired glucose tolerance, majority were well controlled. However, the insulin requirement had been very high in order to maintain normal glycemia. This shows that although a majority of our children had a good blood glucose control, they are doing it with the help of very high levels of insulin, which would lead them to develop insulin resistance with time. A steady rise in home IR, or the insulin resistance, is noted with increase in each of the measured anthropometric parameters, which are measured of measures of fat mass of the body. This highlights the importance of taking measures to prevent excess fat accumulation in the body. The study population was categorized into normal and abnormal groups based on each ab metabolic parameter that we have measured. The mean home IR, or the insulin resistance index, was calculated for each group, and except for total and LDL cholesterol level, all others showed statistically significant insulin resistance in those with the deranged metabolic parameter. These data show that there is an association between metabolic derangement and insulin resistance. The relationship between log-transformed insulin level and body mass index and waist circumference in both fasting and fed states were evaluated. In all instances, it clearly shows 
that with a unit increase in the anthropometric measure of the body, both fasting and post-glucose load insulin level increases. When our data were compared with the data from Wincup study from Britain, which, is, which shows the South Asians in red lines, the results were quite comparable. Therefore, this part of our analysis has shown that the diabetes or pre-diabetic states are not high in this population. However, our data clearly shows that the insulin secretion in the fasting and fed state is quite high and is similar to the value shown in South Asian migrants living in the UK. High postprandial insulin levels in the light of normoglycemia indicate that blood sugar levels are not a suitable method in detecting cardiovascular derangements in early life. Therefore, use of insulin as a screening tool for insulin resistance in children is highlighted by this study as well. Metabolic derangements are directly associated with the insulin resistance. Preliminary work was discussed at the annual sessions of the SLMA 2010, and the full paper was discussed at uh, the World Diabetic Congress. Diagnosis of obesity. The metabolic derangements are related to the fat content of the body in obese individuals, and many different methods had been used to identify obesity in the community. However, in some of my previous work, I have shown that a poor sensitivity of many of these international BMI and waist circumference cutoffs in detecting obesity in children of Sri Lankan origin. This has been even the case for current BMI cutoff values used in adults, especially for South Asian population. And even the WHO have discussed about this in 2002 in Singapore with no conclusions. Still, there is no consensus to which method and which cutoff value is ideal to diagnose obesity in children. We identified nine different methods available in the international literature and cutoff values. Percentage fat mass was used as a reference to diagnosis. And you can see almost one-fifth of the population had a fat mass level which is almost equal or higher than the obesity level. The newly developed Sri Lankan-based BMI and waist circumference standards detect a higher number of children as obese compared to the international cutoff values which we have uh, studied here. Results of these measures were validated uh, of each method used in the diagnosis of obesity. International BMI-based cutoff values had a very low sensitivity by high specificity. Sri Lankan cutoff values showed high sensitivity, which highlight the fact that national standards are of more value than international cutoff values in diagnosing obesity in this population. We evaluated the ability of each of these anthropometric methods in detecting at least one metabolic derangement in this study population. After all, we have to use one of these as the simple anthropometric measure to screen these children in the community. In both boys and girls, the international obesity cutoff had a very low sensitivity. But the sensitivity was improved when the IOTF cutoff was lowered to the overweight level. And the Sri Lankan cutoff values improved the sensitivity with statistic level of specificity. Therefore, in this population, international obesity cutoff showed low prevalence of obesity. This could erroneously delay the detection of non-communicable disease-related metabolic abnormalities. Although the Sri Lankan cutoff values had low specificity, it could be argued that having a low threshold in detecting to detect at least at-risk individuals would provide adequate time to adopt adequate corrective measures. Naturally, a screening tool should have a high sensitivity. Once an individual with potential risk is identified, specific techniques could be adapted to identify specific abnormalities. This would have a positive impact on the health rather than a negative effect. Results were discussed at the inaugural Nutrition and Growth International Conference held in Paris, France, 2012. Rock curves were used, or ROC curves were used to uh, determine the best anthropometric pre uh, predictor of metabolic syndrome in this population. Body mass index, weight circumference, percentage fat mass, waist to hip ratio, and waist 
to height ratio were used. Except for waist to hip ratio, all other had significant area under the curve denoting their usefulness as a screening tool. Waist circumference gave the best area under this curve of more than 95%. The percentage fat mass associated with metabolic syndrome was 28.6% in boys and 32% in girls, which was compared to the data which I initially presented to you from the world literature. Then we, although metabolic syndrome is the final diagnosis, in children, most prudent would be to determine the metabolic derangements in individuals much earlier than they develop metabolic syndrome. Therefore, children with at least two metabolic derangements were tried to be identified using anthropometric measures. And once again, the waist circumference gave the best area under the curve, followed by body mass index. Waist-hip ratio, once again, was a poor predictor. These data show that certain anthropometric measures can be used to screen for metabolic derangements. Waist circumference, as shown by many other studies, is the best determinant, and its use as the absolute criteria in the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome according to the International Diabetic Federation criteria is justifiable, even in this population of children. It is important to determine the most sensitive cutoff value for the detection of abnormal metabolic profiles in the community. The impact of early nutrition on development of obesity and related metabolic morbidity. New knowledge has shown that patterns of early growth reflect future health of an individual. Therefore, these facts have given insight to early origin of adult diseases and introducing new avenues of primordial and primary prevention of such illnesses. Malnutrition and its consequences in postnatal life and at a specific point in time are always discussed. Epidemiological studies have shown that early nutrition has long-term effects. Based on retrospective observational epidemiological studies, David Barker noted that nutritional status of early life determined the occurrence of many adult diseases later. An epidemiological relationship was seen between death rates due to coronary heart disease and newborn deaths of the same birth cohort in early 1900s in Britain. Barker noted that small for date individuals are the most disadvantageous. These obs observations led to look at the human life as one continuum from conception till death and birth being only an event which lead to change in the environment they grow. This marked the beginning of fetal origin of adult disease hypothesis on many non-communicable diseases. Since then, the quest began to identify the exact effects responsible for different adverse health outcomes later in life. Data presented by Bach in 1989 showed that those who were born small and became big at 10 years of age, denoted by the red circles, have a worse metabolic profile than those who were born big and had a higher weight gain later in life, the green circles. Those who were born small and remain small are metabolically more protected as much as those who were born with a high birth weight uh, denoted by the blue circles. The same pattern was observed in the same cohort when they were 36 years of age. There are so many, uh, then the cohort was stratified according to the maturity, the, the premature term and the postmature individuals, but there was no relationship noted in, the, uh, in that group. There are so many studies which have shown similar results and even effects as low as four years of age. So you can see that the impact of early nutrition is much early in life. India is a country where there is a high prevalence of low birth weight. This study did not show a significant association between birth weight and metabolic derangement during late adolescence. But a high odds ratio for coronary heart disease risk factors and diabetes was seen in those who had low birth weight and were better nourished at the time of the study than those who had a low birth weight but were undernourished at the time of the study. 
this shows late growth as much as uh, has a much stronger influence on non-communicable disease development than birth weight alone. These observations made Barker to postulate that changes in environment influence the outcome later in life. An individual who was programmed to take a specific course of, in growth gets it altered due to alteration in the environment and more prone to develop non-communicable disease-related changes later in life. Adverse health outcomes were noted with overfeeding as opposed to undernutrition immediate postnatal period. If Barker's hypothesis was applicable, then most of the non-communicable diseases should have had a higher prevalence in Asia and Africa for a long period of time. But as we see today, despite the improvement in birth weight in many of these countries, such as China and India, there is a rise in incidence of these NCDs. The change we observed in many of these countries today is a nutritional transition from a conservative Asian diet to a high calorie and high fat containing westernized diet, accompanied by less physical activity. Therefore, fetal undernutrition cannot be the sole cause for late onset non-communicable disease, but events that happen later in life could be contributing. Sri Lanka is also facing the same transition. Manipulation of early nutrition has shown the effect may in many aspects of health. This study from Great Britain showed that rapid growth in preterm children had elevated blood pressure, cholesterol, and insulin with significant endothelial dysfunction at 16 years of age. Similarly, when term small for date infants were given enriched formula to promote the catch-up growth they showed elevated blood pressure and increased fat mass at eight years of age. These experiments led Atul Sigal and Alan Lucas to propose the postnatal growth acceleration hypothesis. In our sample, we had 83 uh, children with the full birth weight details. And they were assessed to evaluate the relationship between metabolic derangements and their birth weight. Group was categorized into tertiles. Based on these two parameters, three by three tables were constructed for the mean of the measured metabolic parameter. The metabolic parameters were analyzed in each group. And if you focus to the table, the worst affected were those who were born small but had a higher BMI at the time of the study, denoted by the red background. Then those who were born small and remain small in the blue background were fairly protected. This was the case when it came to systolic blood pressure. And you can see that there is a statistically different, significant difference between the low birth weight turtile in the high uh, BMI at the current time of study versus the low BMI value. Similar patterns were observed for diastolic blood pressure. Then two hours after the glucose load, the random blood sugar levels. And you can see even in the lipid profile, all parameters of the lipid profile had got its effect. Even for ALT levels denoting the damage to the liver associated with the weight gain in these children. When the body fat mass in the lower birth, lowest birth turtile was compared across different current BMI turtiles, the brown columns, the percentage fat mass in the highest BMI turtile had very high levels compared to other two BMI turtiles. This was the case even in the other two birth weight uh, turtiles. This denotes that our children put on weight by assimilating fat in the body rather than growing in all spheres of the body composition. The same distributions were noted for fasting insulin, then two hour in uh, post-glucose load insulin level. The home IR, or the insulin resistance, shows the strain on the pancreas starting from a very young age in those who were born small and became bigger later in life than those who remain relatively small throughout their lives. The data have shown that those who were born big and remain big, or those who were born small and remain small are less likely to suffer from adverse metabolic consequences 
than those who were born small but became big later. Therefore, as much as providing nutrition is important, it is also important to provide them with some control, not too much, not too little. Bhargavan and co-workers from India quite clearly showed how thin individuals develop impaired glucose tolerance as young adults when they begin to cross BMI centiles upwards. Birth weight of offspring is closely related to the mother's size. Chronic food shortages may create small mothers and fetal undernutrition. Therefore, combating malnutrition by trying to feed all children is not a favorable thing and is not a straightforward act, but has many aspects in a long timeline. It is important to rectify the birth weight first by improving the nutritional status of the mother if we think to improve the undernutrition without affecting non-communicable disease burden later in life. Thus, it would take a generation long to correct this. Data from these Sri Lankan children have shown that abnormal cardiovascular risk high among those of the lowest birth turtle and highest current BMI turtle. It is seen even at 5 to 10 years of age group, and it is more clear in the 10 to 15 year age group. Those born small and currently have a BMI in the lowest turtle are much more protected. Therefore, big is not good always, and if born small, should try to be small to enjoy better health. Results of this study were again presented as a preliminary report at the 2012 SLCP annual sessions and a full paper at the Paris conference. Then we looked at some of the predisposing factors. As part of looking at some of these predisposing factors for childhood obesity, we collected physical activity data. Also carried out a qualitative survey in a subgroup of obese children to identify probable behavior and sociological predisposing factors, as well as perception and problems faced by obese children and their parents. Results were quite interesting. We assessed the level of physical activity using the International Physical Activity Questionnaire validated for Sri Lankan children by Dr. Charuk Sharampole in 2004. It appeared that male children of both age categories engage in reasonable physical activity. However, the old girl child engage in less physical activity. The physical activity index was compiled using these factors, and it showed that with increase in age, children are moving away from physical activity, especially the female child. This is not a good trend as girl child should be healthier in the battle against NCD to improve the health of the offspring. And quite interestingly, the physical activity levels of the older children are quite comparable to the adult physical inactivity level estimated by the WHO in their 2011 uh, a country profile report on NCD prevention. The children were given the opportunity to express themselves pictorially, and when asked to draw their favorite foods, which they came out quite easily, than direct questioning, these are some of their creations. Non-obese children also showed similar interests, but their portion sizes were far smaller than these denoted in these pictures. These pictures show the place that they have given for more nutritious food. Many children showed that they wished to watch television, and they drew some of their favorite characters, which were mainly cartoons. This chart shows the time that cartoon programs are aired by some of the popular television channels in Sri Lanka on a typical day of a week. Parents were concerned about the number of food advertisements aired during these programs, and when we looked at them, about 15 to 25 percent of the total time allocated for these cartoon programs were spent on commercial commercials. And almost half of those commercials were based on food. Therefore, we have to take serious note of the influence made by these commercials on the development of food-related adverse behavior in our children. The future direction we should be taking. Sri Lanka is now facing a rapid socioeconomic transition after successfully establishing political stability in the country. The country is heading for rapid economic growth with concomitant infrastructure development. 
However, parallel to it, if we could not establish a healthy nation, the fruits of physical development could not be harnessed. The process of prevention of non-communicable diseases in the year 2011 was launched by WHO on non-communicable disease prevention program in Sri Lanka, identifying Sri Lanka as a pathfinder. However, I personally feel that an important part has been left out of this framework. As my research data, alongside of many internationally available data, have clearly shown that origins of NCD are not later in life, but from a very young, stay, early stage of life, and therefore focus should be from a younger age. I think NCD control has to take a different course with more emphasis on the younger age children. More air resources need to be directed to this aspect, and both individual as well as parents need to be empowered to look after their health. Beginning with proper nutrition, coupled with careful growth monitoring to achieve not too much, not too little growth is a crucial beginning. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this study overall has shown a significant number of Sri Lankan children have non-communicable disease-related metabolic abnormalities despite having a normal body mass index value from a very young age. Although many children were normal glycemic, many showed early insulin resistance. Rapid postnatal growth is an important environmental factor contributing to a genetically predisposed and a morphologically small nation. Population-specific screening tools are important for the early detection of metabolic derangements for effective control of non-communicable diseases. NCD prevention has to begin from a very young age, and behavior modification need to be done via having national programs at school level to increase awareness of obesity-related long-term consequences. More opportunity for physical activity, availability of healthy food, especially at school canteens, and a code of advertisement for food items would help to build a healthy nation. Health staff should be more aware of this emerging problem and should actively search for such cases. There should be more supportive staff in the form of counselors, social workers, and dietitians and nutritionists to provide the necessary counseling and guidance on healthy behavior to, the, to these individuals and families in the process of control of non-communicable diseases. Well, it is true that everybody has to die one day of something, but they should not die at a productive age, and also they should not suffer. Trying to prevent all deaths due to NCD is not a realistic goal, but a realistic goal would be to work towards preventing the 25% of deaths of related to NCD that occur the, below the age of 60 years. But we have to start from a very early life. I would like to end my oration this evening by placing a quote made by Professor David Barker, who could be considered as a pioneer in NCD prevention. Thank you.